Um, so this evening we're looking at justice. Um, it's a really interesting topic. Um, it touches our lives every day in countless ways, um, yet often we, we don't realise it. We all have an opinion on it, um, but we very rarely agree um, on what justice is. Um, we live in a country where we, we live under the rule of, your, uh, rule of law, yet we so often feel injustices in our lives and around us. And of course, as, as Christians, as believers, we believe in a just God. Um, what does that mean? And, and how do we marry all of these things together in our lives? It's a vastly complicated topic. Um, so I'm very pleased I'm not tackling it alone. Um, uh, we've had these wonderful introductions for our panelists already, but I'm going to give them a, a few moments now to, to speak a bit about their background so you can uh, kind of become more familiar with their stories as well. Um, so perhaps, um, Ted, you might kick us off um, thinking about a time where you came face to face with justice. Tell us about your, your story. Well, I, I don't want to ruin the mystery or the mystique, uh, but Mike told us that this question would be the first one that was going to be asked. And uh, <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> and, um, and that gave me some time to have a think about it and to uh, think back on my own experience and identify what I think I felt was the specific moment of coming face to face with justice, uh, which, you know, it won't be a surprise when I say that that was stood in the dock in a court and being told I was going to prison. Um, and that was a Friday afternoon, four o'clock in April 2015. And Knowing this question was coming down the line, I got out some of the documentation from that time and took a distinctly unpleasant trip down memory lane. And I took out the sentencing remarks of the judge, um, which are sort of etched on my memory, but there was one line which I always come back to, and he said, um, I'm quite convinced there is nothing you need to be taught, but others in your position must know that there are consequences to their actions. For that reason, I'm not persuaded to suspend the sentence. And it's at that moment where life just falls away and you're just waiting for the number. And in my case, it was nine months of which I served half. And then, and I thought they only did this in films, he literally says, take him down. And I turned that way and saw all of the people who'd come to support me, tried to smile at them, and then was taken through the door down into the cells, belt, shoelaces, tie, off. And sitting there, that's when I think I realised the magnitude of what had just happened. And then probably one further moment in the first couple of weeks, sitting in the van being driven away from court and looking out the window and seeing my best friend on the phone telling other people what had just happened. So that is a, that's my moment of coming face to face with justice. Um, since then, as was alluded to in the, um, in the introduction, I've tried to use that experience to apply some academic framework to that experience so I better understand my own experiences, but also the system, and then have gone on and now work for a marvellous charity called the Ford Trust to deliver drug and alcohol services in prisons. Um, and with a background as, as um, a musician um, sitting on the board of trustees of a charity called Sing Inside, who take small groups of volunteers in to run singing workshops for no other reason, and they're very clear about this, for no other reason than fun. Um, there is no outcomes, there are no reoffending rates taken down from these programmes. It's to go in and have an enjoyable experience, and I'm, I'm quite proud of that, I think. So that is, that's me coming face to face with justice and what I've done with it. That's, that's you in a nutshell. That's me in a nutshell, exactly. Thank you very much. Um, Leroy, I suspect your background is, is a bit easier for people to have discovered, possibly even accidentally. Um, but the same question for you. Um, if you could kind of illuminate us a time where you came face to face with justice. Yeah, well, just, just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here and meet some older and younger faces. I'll let you choose which is which. <laughs> and, um, and, and feeling that 
with family, so I'll, I'll be somewhat relaxed um, and, and, and be truthful with you. Um, my, my first sort of, I'll, I'll make two um, instances. Um, the opening scene of Small Axe is little Leroy being stopped on the school gates of his school, just finished band practice in full uniform and his trumpet case and being searched by police officers and the white members of my band, well, it was my band, but other band members actually just walked past um, and they weren't being, they weren't being stopped. So that was about 12, 13 years old and that's when I had this rude awakening of justice and what it meant and the trauma and the humiliation and feeling you must have done something wrong for them to even approach you, much less you have to go through that. Fortunately, my father turned up, as in the film, and he made it clear that they should step away from his son and leave him alone, and they did, surprisingly. I don't know um, why they did, because they could have beat him up there and then, and that was in... Um, 1969, sorry, 79, 69, 69, sorry. So yeah, it, but unfortunately, uh, years later, in 1988, they did beat him. And this is the second instance when I saw Face to Face with Justice because um, he was literally beaten black and blue. Um, and I remember seeing him in the accident emergency because I got a call from my sister saying he was beaten up over a traffic matter. And I was thinking, over a traffic matter? And he's 57, he's not someone who's gonna pick a fight, you know, he's not 17 or, you know, or that similar sort of age, rebellious age sometimes. Anyway, he, um, he survived it, um, wasn't very pleased about me joining the police, <laughs> as you can imagine. But I was in, so am amazed by his, maturity and his wisdom and his love for me that he actually said I'll support you despite you joining the ranks of the officers that beat me up and when the only way I could do that is just to be in solidarity with him especially when he went to court we were successful in suing the Met for unlawful arrest and excessive force and I remember turning up in full uniform. I'd just been made a sergeant. So I, I'd actually removed from that unit where, because I, I started in Islington, that's where my parents live, that's where my father was beaten up. So when I get promoted, I'm now, there's a bit of distance. So I'm even stronger, I'm now promoted to sergeant. I'm in a different borough, I was in the borough of Enfield. And so I was really pleased I could just turn up in full uniform with permission, I couldn't just do it without the appropriate authority, and just be there with him. And I, I, it was an amazing sense of solidarity for my father, facing justice, who I'm a part of. And that was, I thought, <laughs> I, don't th I don't know many people are gonna face your contemporaries or your colleagues in that way. But I was pleased to do that because that's how I've conducted my service. I'm willing to challenge. And what, one of the things that really, and I'll close with this, what, one of the things that really gripped me was, as I was standing with my father and other members of the family, I saw the officers huddling. This was before they came up with the result that my father was successful in his civil action. And they were just huddling in a group, and they were looking around and they were thinking, is he a real police officer? <laughs> you know. Um, and then, and that, really inspired me to, about this closing ranks piece at the expense of the truth and justice. And that f was uh, burned in my mind, in my psyche, about how I need to get in that huddle or in that circle or in that group and challenge it in a way that it's gonna have some sort of long-term legacy. Um, I think I've done that.
That's really helpful. Thank you. Just on that on that latter situation with your with your father, how has your perspective, if at all, um, changed over the years? Thinking back to that time, do you do you think justice was done in that situation? Well, he was successful, <clears throat> but he... justice for me was the initial incident. Those officers were judge and jury and executioner in a way on how they treat my father. Um, I don't share this very often. Um, and I didn't know this until quite recently, but those officers, when they beat him up, they intentionally dragged him through feces. Now, if I had known that, I don't think I would have could have joined the mat because I was very resentful anyway, but the calling was so strong. But to know that my sister shared this with me only about a year ago, after the screening of the Small Axe film, and I said, gosh, I'm glad you didn't tell me because I, I could have lasted 30 years. But they actually dragged him through feces. Um, so that, for me, was where justice should have been done. But you... You, you have to work the system and challenge it in a way that it's, it's clear to everyone that justice has been seen to be done. So I suppose the, the court case was um, a part of that. I mean, my dad did, didn't get his day in court. He didn't go in the dock. He didn't see the officers giving evidence because they capitulate before all of that. So the, the fact that I suppose he didn't have his day in court, I suppose he didn't have his justice. But the good thing was he, his um, character remained intact. And that was really important for him. And I think that's what you want to have is you have your, the essence of who you are shouldn't be eroded regardless of what's happened to you, whether you're in the dock or not. It, justice should be fair and whether that person accepts it or not, they should know that they haven't been persecuted because of the colour of their skin or their gender or their lifestyle or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ted, just, just on your kind of, your journey as it were, in terms of where you've been, where you are now, how has that kind of shaped your view of the justice system? Well, I think, like a lot of people, my experience of the justice system before being in it was from popular culture, a bit of the press. Um, and so, having been on the sharp end of it, as it were, has utterly changed my perspective on it. I don't think it could not do that. Um, I'm interested you talk about, you know, feeling justice had been done and, and other people seeing that justice had been done. And that quote that I gave from the sentencing remarks for the first week or so of my prison sentence, I was feeling a little bit resentful. Why am I being sent to prison for the purposes of other people? But actually, there's a lot of time to think in prison. And thinking about it and praying about it very quickly, actually, I realised that, in a sense, I needed to have been sent to prison in order for me to feel like I had been appropriately dealt with and to feel that justice had been done there. And I think if it had been a suspended sentence or a community order, as we thought it was going to be, I think I would have struggled more, um, which is not something that I was expecting to feel, but did. And in terms of... I suppose how that experience has shifted my perspective on what I want to do with my life. There's one sort of moment in prison where I realised what I had to do, what I felt I had an almost obligation to do, certainly a vocation to do, um, which was saying goodbye to somebody who was being released on the, on the Friday, um, sort of wishing him luck and he goes out and Two weeks later, there he is again, queuing up for dinner and saying, well, what are you doing? And he said to me, well, at least it's warm and I have some friends in here. 
And I think it's that, it was that precise moment where I realised, OK, well, my various privileges, being from a relatively um, middle-class background, being white, and uh, having come into contact with the justice system at the point at which I had a university education and all the rest of it, meant that I was always going to be all right at worst afterwards. And this guy, <coughs> for him, that place, which is the worst place I could possibly have ended up, was the best thing in his life. And my perspective just went, you know, 180 degrees. And that's directed, I think, probably everything I try and do now. Mm. Mm. I think, I mean, you, you both obviously have really unique insights. Um, I mentioned as we started this, we, we hear a lot about justice, injustice, um, in all different manner of circumstances, social justice, climate justice, racial justice. Is it that we're, we're hearing it more? Is it that people are more vocal at the moment? Or are there still these great burning injustices, you know, today? Um, if so, what, what do you see as the kind of biggest injustices of our, our time at the moment? I think probably both of those things can be true. The great injustices are still there, and we're also hearing about them more through various, you know, social media being the, the thing that springs most quickly to mind. Um, conversation between people across the world can happen much, much, much easier than it ever could before. And injustices on the other side of the world that we would never have heard about are at our fingertips and on our phones. Um, I think if you start dwelling on all of the injustices in the world, it can get very overwhelming quite quickly. Um, and I think most people here, perhaps, pick their area and try and chip away at those injustices. And I think that's all you can do, but a critical mass of people doing that chipping away at whatever it is, whether it's climate or race or criminal justice, or is um, it's the only way to affect change, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I, I think it's a bit of both. There's, um, um, I think there's this hardening across the world around, you know, very tough leadership, very transactional, um, dictatorial. And that seems to be very personality driven. So you've got these tough leaders and they're willing to carry out their actions without impunity and against human rights violations of one form or another. So you've got that hardening right across the world. Um, and You've seen it in COVID, how it's laid bare so many injustices and inequalities around the world, and obviously it's at the one screen or another, um, your phone, etc. So, yeah, I think there is definitely a greater awareness. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why George Floyd is such a factor. I mean, I think the world changed after George Floyd. Um, I remember writing an article about the irony of Chauvin using his knee to extinguish the life out of George Floyd, when the knee is a form of reverence, respect. And it was also the, the way in which Colin Kaepernick, who an American footballer used to protest about police violence. And I think all of that coming together it just shows this real purity of the message about justice and knowing how far you can go with it to the extent that you can extinguish life and get a sense, well, I was only doing my job or, you know, that's what we do, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, those injustices has, I think, created awareness, an allyship, a form of unity, which I believe has 
allowed conversations that you wouldn't normally have. Um, I, myself, I've been asked to speak in not just police circles, the army, um, corporate organizations who invariably say, well, you know, all we want to know is about the bottom line. But they are actually understanding how justice is, is not just about the law, it's about relationships. And that's how I believe the Black Lives Matter movement, even though I don't agree with everything, but it's, it's around understanding the plight of people of color over the generations and how it plays itself out, maybe not killing someone, but it might be persecuting them in some way or withdrawing their rights and not understanding them in a way that you can stereotype and make assumptions about them and reduce their life choices. So I think the world changed. Um, I would like to think it's for the better. Um, and I, 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 I don't think it's a coincidence that justice is really coming up, resonating with so many organisations. Because I, I think you want to you want a just society so you can operate better, more efficiently, more effectively, more lovingly, so that you can deal with the other problems, you know, whether it's climate change or COVID or anything like that. You know, you just just want to feel that if something happens, people are being respectful and, and treating people with dignity, regardless of their background or what they've done or not done. Because at the end of the day, for me, it's, I don't want those injustices and inequalities impacting on my grandchildren, as it's impacting my children's generation, my generation, and my parents' generation. I don't want my ch grandchildren's generation to go through that. That, that, that for me is, um, if we can get people to think about this and don't believe they're in their little bubble in wherever, it's, it's a we. It's, it's not just about them, it's a we. Yeah, and I think it's, it'd be interesting to hear from your perspective where the failure currently is. I mean, we, obviously we have laws. Is it a failure of the law? Is it a failure of morality? Um, there's also a spiritual element to this as well. Um, some might say it's a, a distance from God. Where, where do you see the kind of the current failure in terms of uh, lack um, of justice? I think, it's all of that. I, I think there's a the, the, there's definitely a, a moral compass move to the extreme where people are, are just not understanding just just fairness and understanding of others. I, I've seen in the police. You know, the police now has got, there's a strong perception that it's a safe haven for predators of one form or another, whether it's racism or sexism, misogyny. And in certain subcultures, that they seem to flourish. Because, again, cousins who kidnapped, raped, and killed Sarah Everard was known as rapey. He was known on WhatsApp groups as rapey. Now, someone tell me, didn't someone need to talk to that guy? Especially when he was found exposing himself in certain places, months before, and then the day before, or something on, on that proximity. And then you think, where, what, what's the supervisors doing? You know, the sergeants, the inspectors, and, and higher. Because I know if I had an officer or officers like that, I definitely want to spot them because I want to, it, again, it's around the relationships. You, they're not just a number, they're a human being. So we need to know what their strengths or weaknesses, how we can help them. But more importantly, we are part of the checks and balances to, to ensure that everyone knows their role, we're public servants, 
Uh, and as I used to see it, we're, we're peacemakers, we're sons and daughters of God. So let's know that service, that servant leadership is the key, uh, and that ethical leadership. And so I, th- th- there just seems to be a lack of it, or some or people more complicit by their silence, or their just say they just accept it. It's the acceptance bit that really I just can't figure it out. Having been in that culture, um, so there's this toxicity element of it, and the fact that there's still this closing ranks, this institutional defensiveness, and and the, and the main protagonist is the commissioner. And I don't say that easily, because I've known her for 20 odd years. But, but she just seems to be the blockage. <laughs> Not saying, right, come in, have a look, what we're doing right, doing wrong, let's get on with this. So th- there is definitely this perfect storm of a lack of it, ethical leadership, um, love and respect for people, and this moral bankruptcy where everyone just thinks, it, in the name of taking a joke, you can be a racist, sexist, homophobic, you name it. Because it's just banter, isn't it? It's just like the young man in Yorkshire cricket. It was just banter, don't be silly, you know. You're too sensitive. You've got a chip on your shoulder. Come on, that's how it starts. And then it can go from bad to worse, and fortunately, Cousins is a case in point. Instead, where do you see the, the kind of, that mix of things? Well, as you were talking, I, <laughs> I was just about to say almost exactly the opposite of something you said towards the end of your contribution there, and I think I was trying quite hard to, to come at it in a positive way. And what I mean by that is, I think within particularly younger generations increasingly, there is now less of a willingness to do that standing by. And I think that's kind of the, potentially the flip side of, um, of uh, the fact that these injustices, whatever they might be, can be discussed across the world by people from all sorts of different walks of life. It strikes me that particularly, as I say, in younger age groups, people are less willing now to turn away from, from things that they see that are offensive or damaging to other people, I hope. Um, and we, you know, we've all been following that story and um, the Metropolitan Police is a com- complex institution with lots of complex stuff, go- dynamics going on between the people who run it and work in it. And, but uh, I'd really like to think that it's becoming increasingly unusual, that kind of closing ranks. And I think the climate stuff is a great example of um, the younger generation standing up and saying, actually, you need to stop looking the other way, just because you'll all be dead by the time the, <laughs> the effects are really felt, doesn't mean that we can just we can just turn away from that sort of thing. Is it, is it complacency, then, that we're talking about, essentially? Well, like, maybe it is complacency. I, I mean, I'm sort of trying to bring it back towards a, a faith-based view. And I think over recent decades there has... I mean, this is not an original thought, but there has been an increasing turn in on the self, right? It's all about ourselves and our... Uh, our happiness and our, our wealth and, and, uh, and that sounds a lot to me like a drift away from God um, n- now it's a dangerous path to start down of course because people can be moral and people can care and people can stand up and not be believers but even within our own churches we've seen a lot of that and we need to be modelling we need to model this kind of caring approach and to, with a crunch of gears, bring it back round to prisons. Um, I, my doctoral work is looking at 
as people leave prison, how they're welcomed into faith communities. And as somebody who has left prison and uh, spoken to a lot of people who are Christians, some of the most Christian and some of the least Christian responses that I've experienced have been from Christians. Um, and that has been, you know, in, in the, the best responses have been fantastic. The worst responses have been absolutely appalling and leave me standing there going, well, hang on, but you're calling yourself a Christian. How, how, is, this, how is it possible for you to, to react like this? to somebody who's served a prison sentence and is coming out and saying, here I am, a beloved child of God just like everybody else. Please welcome me into your community. Um, so I think we need to work hard as institutions and as individuals and as Christians to wrestle our gaze away from how certain courses of action are going to make us look. And I think that's the root of a lot of the responses, the, the, the less Christian responses that I'm alluding to. And look after our brothers and sisters. And if we do that, then those injustices, great or small, I think, start being chipped away at, like I said in response to the last answer. Could I just, um, just uh, add to what has just been said about young people? I, I, I agree. That, that's why I mentioned Black Lives Matter. That's mainly young people saying enough is enough. And, <clears throat> and, and I love the allyship across the country of demonstrations around key issues that's going back centuries, you know, whether it's co corporations and how they got their money and certain people in, put on statues and you know, um, made to be um, people who haven't got any skeletons in the cupboard, let's say. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, having run a charity for the last 20 years called Void Youth, I, I know the young people are understanding how to operate in a way that uh, reminds me when we, we were facing the National Front. Do you know, around this area, um, in the 70s, if you were black, very risky place to walk around, even, even around here. Um, Canary Wall, forget it. <laughs> um, Canning Town, well, take your life in your own hands. Because that's, that's where the National Front used to the, you know, now they're further out in Kent and all these areas, but South East London as well, it was really, really bad. Um, and we came together with a mantra, um, black and white, unite and fight, fight the National Front. So I know it's been done before, and I'm glad to see a similar sort of coming together. Um, so yes, definitely our young people, I believe, are restoring my, my faith in people's unity around this issue. But I, I still think there is definitely a blockage for them getting into some of these public organisations like the police and not just surviving and striving and achieving the true potential because the cultures are so strong and dominant, which I touch on in the book because, you know, I had to call it out for what it is. I haven't got any proof to the extent of what it is, but... I know that Masonic Lodge is a massive, massive impact in the police, like other organisations. And um, I'm not saying it's the only reason why, but I really believe that the turning your back on God and, and meaning that you can allow someone you know has committed an offence and you have to help them out because you're in the same lodge. I mean, that's crazy. But... People have tried to look at this issue and they've, they've stopped. You know, even Theresa May tried to. Um, but I think that's a factor that's really starting to emerge. And uh, I think the devil's having a field day at the moment in certain parts of uh, the police and 
other organizations. So, but to get around it, um, other than say, you know, your sin and sort yourself out type thing, you know. I know we say, we, you know, we have to try and love the sinner but hate the sin. Um, but one of the things that we try to do is have officers, let's say, get, get officers to think that not everyone is a nail, because I call it a hammerhead type mentality. Everything is a nail. It's just drive, drive, drive. So, so you have to talk to them in a way, well, actually, maybe that person who's committed that crime may be traumatized in some way. So don't just look at them as a prisoner, look at them as a patient, and just bring out the humanity in them to recognize the humanity in, in that person they're dealing with, or that situation they're dealing with. And that's part of the public health approach and being trauma-informed and trauma-responsive. So this is the, I suppose, the transactional way to do it, um, and trying to change the culture. Because I, I've said time and time again, no strategy is going to work until you get culture change. Because culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's simple as that. So unless you get the reform moving the culture along, you're not really going to get what you want to see. And um, that's why I, I did an article only a few weeks ago for the Spectator to say, well, actually, the commissioner's not equipped to deal with that because you need someone who's not going to be institutionally defensive but transformational and being open and transparent in what they need to do. So I, I, I really think it's, there's ways of doing it. Um, and and I'm, I, I don't want to be coming across gloom and doom, you know. <laughs> um, but, because I, um, I know when you point the finger, there's three fingers pointed back at you saying, what are you doing? So that's how I'm working um, with organisations to get that culture change, even though we're outside. But the allyship also inside is encouraging me. And the younger officers <coughs> who haven't been steeped in the culture are showing some good signs. Yeah. I think you've, you've both alluded to this slightly, which I'll, I'll, I'll come back to at some point. Um, as Christians, we have, when we're thinking about justice, we have these wonderful other words that we, <coughs> that we associate, things like grace, things like mercy, um, which are, are really important. Before we get to that, I, I want to ask uh, one question, which is about retribution. I, I warned Ted this question was coming, so he, he's prepared. Um, <laughs> I think for a lot of people, <laughs> I think for a lot of people, uh, retribution is is a part of justice. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Huh. In a nutshell. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's really complicated, and you know, in, in the introduction, it was mentioned that I went and did a did a master's in criminology, and being in a twenty first century university, a sociology department, a criminology department, and not thinking that we ought to abolish prisons, is sort of I'm on the outside, and people's reactions were, I, I mean, it just did not compute with people. Not only are you here doing this degree and you, you're not an abolitionist, but you've been to prison and you're still not an abolitionist. And people's heads, you know, you could see them exploding, that I, I wasn't telling that particular line, drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, and, and the reason it's complicated for me is something I mentioned a little while ago, where, where I think that serving the prison sentence the deprivation of liberty as that punishment, the, the retributive element of that sentence, is something which meant that when I was released from prison, I could feel somehow that um, I'd repaid the debt that was being asked of me in exchange for this thing that I did. And that's not a particularly trendy view. Um, but it just happens to be the truth for me that that, that retributive element um, helped. However, that's me. 
and you know I've been to prison once very briefly I can say <laughs> with as much certainty as possible that it's not happening again but there are people in prison who are on their 15th 20th 25th sentence and if our approach is well we are going to punish you out of this you are going to stop offending because at some point on sentence number 27 you're going to go ah yes right i need to stop behaving like this this is why i'm going to prison it's absolute nonsense we cannot punish people out of lives of crime that they are finding themselves in you know I, my my course mates would say through no fault of their own I would say through some fault of their own, but predominantly a whole host of other injustices. Um, so there's no clear answer there. Sorry. Um, I, but, but I suppose to boil it down, I believe that some type of retribution has a role to play. In some cases, that is for the person being punished, like in my case. And in some cases, there is an argument that societally, justice being seen to be done in that way um, can be beneficial. But the way we're doing it at the moment with a prison system full of 86,000 people, a huge number of whom are doing sub 12 month sentences, 73% of whom will go on to reoffend when they come out after their sub 12 month sentence, it's not working the punishment approach is not working um, and the sooner we we realize that well we all know it the prime minister knows it the justice secretary knows it but it's a vote loser to say it um, but the sooner it's addressed and blimey don't ask me how we go about that that the better so let's, let's think then about Could, can I just, oh yeah sure. uh, comment on that? Uh, i mean yeah the 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 point I was talking about when I faced justice as a result of my father being dealt with by officers as, you know, um, judge and jury and executioner type thing. Um, and they were getting their retribution and they, fortunately they do play it out on a regular basis through racial profiling and um, even class profiling as well. It's not just a colour thing, it's a class thing. And my sense is that there's this propensity is to be seen to be doing something, you know, you've got to flood the streets, you know, this, uh, and then you, you have to justify people being stopped unnecessarily and not getting results, and you see the disproportionality if you're black, you're nine times more likely to be stopped than your white counterparts, and it, it gets worse with set roadblocks where officers don't have to show reasonable grounds because the authority is given by the superintendent. Well, it used to be at my level. Now it's an inspector. Um, and it's over 20 times being stopped for black and white. So it's these sort of a sense that it, it, it comes like it's, well, we want to persecute people. And, and it, it gives me this sense of officers uh, carrying out the control and power, because they're drawn to it. Some people are into a power trip, that's why they join the police and other authority levels. Not all, but, but um, there are some. And it's their way of playing their power trip and getting their own retribution piece as well. Um, we've already said, it just, you can't arrest you about the problem, you can't stop and search you about the problem, because all you're doing is creating a perfect storm for someone to re repeat offend. Because there's so many less options for them once they get a record and, and uh, even if they want to try and turn their lives around, there's so many negative influences, not just from the police, but from their colleagues or you know, the perpetrators, you know, their, their, their co-Ds, co-defendants type th people. So, there, there, there really needs to be a change in, in, there needs to be a reset about this. And, and yes, punishment is necessary, 
And, but it has to be just. It has to be really clear that it's actually going to rehabilitate that person. It's not just retribution. You want to rehabilitate. You want them to come out and be positive citizens and they, they're not going back to the same behaviour, the same environment, doing the same things and turn up for dinner a week later. So, yeah, it, there's definitely something very clear for... A, there's a clear message of just going back to real basics about punishment and the effect of it. And is it really going to... I'm not saying um, be light on the, on the crime and the retribution, but you've got to go further upstream with the causes of it with those individuals. And unfortunately, the system is so stretched, they're not getting the rehabilitation, they're not getting the, the, the support, even when they go out on the probation. And, um, you know, and that's because of austerity. They ripped into these organisations that capacity is almost... They're overwhelmed. And they, officers are not given... Or whether it's police officers or prison officers, or whoever in the justice system, are not giving the service they would like to give, because they are stretched, and the service is not there. So it does seem to be more persecution <laughs> as time goes on. It, at the beginning of your response just then, you, you referred to you and your father, and that exposed for me the gaping uh, gap in my original response, which I'm ashamed of, really, now. Um, which is that when we talk about retribution, and we get very squeamish about this, but we need to talk about victims. And, you know, the victim has a slightly odd role within our criminal justice system in that they're removed from the process relatively early on, although increasingly things like victim impact statements are playing a part of sentencing. But I wonder, and I, I pose this as a question rather than as an answer, I wonder to what extent we can say that some form of retribution, even quite harsh retribution, is justified if that is something which helps the victim of an offence move beyond it, if they feel like the punishment that the person who has committed an offence against them has somehow it seems like quite a facile phrase, but made up for it, or gone some way to atone for it. Uh -huh. um, and I don't think we should discount the fact that actually some retribution in order for a victim to move on with their lives is actually a justified use of it. Mm. And I catch that in saying, you know, I don't think this is... This is half-baked thoughts now, but I think it's something we ought to bear in mind. Mm. Mm. And I think, so, let, let's, so let's kind of flip that then now and have a look at mercy, have a look at grace. Um, from your, your faith, your, your background, how have these concepts shaped your thinking as you're thinking about justice and as you think about retribution as well? Um. Well, let's say during my career, I, I found it being, um, being a Christian easier to being a cop and surviving that environment without undermining my own principles and my values. So I was very, you know, I had my red lines, very clear, you know, as a, as a, a Christian cop with... Um, certain amount of attitude as well. I, I, I wasn't diluting or any way softening up my, my approach because I didn't see it as just a nine-to-five job. I, I see it as a commission. I actually did. That's the only way I could really survive. This is not just about uh, a vocation. So I, I, I made it, 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 it was, it's like this badge, you know, that was my badge of honour and, and how I had to stick with it 
Um, it's from the first week in my foundation course in um, Hendon. And saying, well, I haven't come to make friends. I've, I've actually come to make changes. Uh, don't ask me why I said it. I mean, well, divine intervention in that, just to have the gall to say that in front of a classroom of people. And I knew it was going to get, go around Hendon like wildfire. We didn't have the internet, but rumour control was just as, a, as effective as what's up. And, um, yeah, it, 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 it actually made it easier for me because even before I went to my first station at, in Islington, they knew where I stood. So I was going to show mercy. I was going to show a justice that, for me, was like salt and light. I had to do it that way, or I was going to undermine my own principles. And I couldn't do that. Um, I also made it clear that I was a black man who happened to be a cop, not a cop who happened to be black. Because in the former, you're more likely to integrate and not adopt the norms and values of the organisation. Whereas if it's the latter, and you are a cop who happens to be black, then you, there is a greater tendency to assimilate and adopt the norms and values of the culture, and that could undermine your mercy and, and your justice. So you have to be very clear. And I suppose that's, that's what's lived with me the whole time. I have not compromised on that one iota. So I'm able to have a wider brief than maybe um, other people who think, well, you know, I've got to, I don't want to upset people. I mean, I, I don't mind upsetting people for justice. I don't up mind upsetting people for mercy. I really don't. I don't mind being public enemy number one. I've lived with it. I've been investigated because of it. So, and, and, it's, and I'll close by this. I, I just think it's because I'm equipped to deal with it. Um, mentally, um, spiritually, you know, I'm, I'm walking around with that armour. Um, you say you, you don't mind it. Do you think this is something that we should all be doing? Um, that we should all essentially not... I, 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 I wouldn't want to put my lifestyle into <laughs> people's um, thinking. It, it, it's, it's really how I'm wired. Um, I, I don't know many people like me. Um, I, but I really think that there's something about social justice and being quite militant about it. Um, I'm not in any way suggesting I'm anything like Jesus Christ, but you couldn't get a more militant person if you thought about it. it I mean, he was radical to the extent that his little small scope of land where he ministered impact the whole world. Um, but I, as I said, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just, just seeing how we operated. It was literally no compromise. And if that means you've got to call it out, you call it out. Because I, I've never felt I'm alone. I mean, I've got an army of nations, a royal priesthood. So when I go into any sort of meeting or anywhere else, I feel I've got to say something clear and definitive. The Lord gives me something, and and this is this is faith in action, time and time again. But I don't I don't feel any sense that I am being isolated. It's and some people might think I'm a religious nut, but I just it's just how I believe I operate best on the edge, pushing through. And I'm 65 next month, sorry, in January. And I don't feel any sense of just cooling it down. I'm getting hotter as I'm getting on, <laughs> literally in this room with this polar neck. <laughs> but but uh, no, I, I, for me, I'm, I'm just, I, I think I'm getting more radical as I'm getting older. <laughs> radical for Christ. It's wonderful, it's wonderful. And, and Ted, for you, for <laughs> mercy and grace and, and how those ship your thinking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just listening to that, and um, you know, I'm the. I suppose I'm the author of the uh, of this book that people are less interested in hearing from. Sorry, that Jonathan is not here, um, but Jonathan, learn. Jonathan's written 18 books, and this is my first. And 
um, learning from him has been an incredible experience. But blimey, if there's someone who doesn't care what people think of him, that's him. And, you know, he's, he's not been too well recently, and so as a result of that, I've ended up doing most of the um, publicity interviews, radio and dizzy heights of the Church Times. Um, and Don't knock it. I'm, I, I, <laughs> believe me, I'm not. <laughs> this is it. This is the pinnacle. Um, but it's been a little bit scary, actually. You know, I've been putting my life back together for six years since going to prison, and this is me putting my name to something and saying, OK, this is what happened. I went to prison, and now I'm trying to do something about it. And, you know, for that to be the first association that people make with your name is... That's a decision. You, know, you make that decision, and you say, well, this is OK. I'm OK to be known by this. Jonathan, of course, is saying, oh, well, just go and do it. You know, uh, it's never done me any harm. You just need to be brave and stand up. And, you know, what, what are people going to do? It's just words, isn't it? So I need... <laughs> yes, OK, I'll go and do the interview. I need some of that armour. Um, but before I went to prison, I thought there was a fairly high likelihood that I'd end up being a priest. And... I would have called myself a Christian. I did call myself a Christian before I went to prison. And then I was arrested. And then I went to confession. And I don't know what I was before I went to that confession. But the grace that I experienced in that half an hour totally revolutionised what I thought and what I believed in and who I knew to be Christ. Um, and, you know, that happened, and then I started rebuilding my relationship with God, and then I had to go through the process of the secular, um, just, uh, yeah, the secular justice process, I suppose. Afterwards, and now still, when I'm talking to people about, you know, when I'm in a job interview or I'm doing this sort of thing or I'm speaking to somebody at a drinks party and they say, what do you do? And you go, oh, here we go, right. This is going to be a 40-minute conversation. Um, I'm asking for mercy every time from that person. And I don't, I don't know if that ever changes in this position. I don't know if I will ever have that conversation in a job interview or with someone at a drinks party and say, this is me and this is what I do and this is my experience. Please be merciful. And it does mean that instigating those sorts of relationships takes on a very odd complexion. Um, and I've, you know, I have spoken to Jonathan about this. And his response is, well, just don't. Don't ask for it. Don't bother. Just be who you are. Be proud of it. Be, stand up. But that's harder than it looks. And maybe it'll happen one day. Maybe one day I'll have this amount of armour. I hope so. But at the moment, there's grace from there. And there's mercy from the people I meet. And that's enough. I think that that's been really helpful on, a, on a, an individual level in terms of your kind of approaches and um, those responses. And, and you, you know, you're both still so active. I say still. <laughs> At the ripe old age. Well, a bit older than I <laughs> <laughs> you're both still, you're, you're both really active. On a more kind of corporate level, thinking about church, um, is the church doing enough in your eyes at the moment? Um, it's a big question. Um, I'll start by saying um, it's just like this building here. And I would, 
um, this time. Some you described has been here almost a thousand years. Yes? And I could picture it being the center of the, that community as it was then. Uh, thank you. And um, I, I just think that the church really needs to get back to being in the center. Because there is that sense that it's, you know, it's elitist and it's, it looks down on people. When I speak to people who have, of no faith, oh, I'm going to church because you know, that's for middle class white people. And I hear that all the time from people in my community, African Caribbean community. So I think that, that, that for me is a need. There is a need for the church to really understand what the center is. Um, and that getting equipped for people who are asking questions and they really want them answered. Unfortunately, there's too many things on social media answer them, and it's fake news, a lot of it. But, and I give an example. In 2006, I, I brought over uh, a gang evangelist called Nicky Cruz. You might, might have heard of him. And um, I'm proud to say I'm, I'm still the only person I brought him over from the States for an, an outreach. Um, he's, he's done visits, but he's never done an outreach program. And we brought out his... Um, his outreach um, team called Truce to, to reach urban communities everywhere. And we did outreach in the summer of 2006 in Hackney and Walton Forest. And it's an amazing, amazing response. In, in three weeks, we had 1,800 youngsters responding to the, the music ministry, going into the estates and, and having the music that they, I can identify with very contemporary rap music. And, um, and it was working with churches, street pastors, um, uh, Salvation Army, and a, a raft of volunteers. And, and so these people have to go somewhere, right? Because they responded to the message. And the first uh, um, port of call was when Nikki came over, three weeks later, we had amazing services in Hackney. Um, in an area, in a place called Oceans. It's now cinema on Main Street. Anyway, amazing. So we're now seeing where they live, where can we feed them into the church? Um, I'm really sad to say <laughs> only one church was really equipped for not only the volume, but also the nature of the individuals. And, and uh, that for me was similar to. Uh, certain outreaches I've seen where um, they want to be salt and light and they will outreach, but they think, hold on, we're not equipped to really deal with. Some people have got some, they've been to the School of Hard Knocks, they have some real struggles. And I, that for me is the call to action. How is the church not only responding to those questions that people need answered, but then how do you keep them engaged? Especially with you know, the poverty um, that we're seeing um, and the inequalities on a day-to-day -day basis. How many people living on the streets now? Again, the figures are going through the roof as they were 10 years ago. So that's, that's, that's where I think the church really needs to look itself in the eye. And other voluntary organisations, and some are responding um, to that. Um, I'm, I'm a trustee for um, an organisation called Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge is a rehabilitation of alcohol and drug addictions through abstinence, you know, it's through discipleship, it's through the word. And... I've been trustee since 2006. So it's 15 years, and I've never known Teen Challenge to turn anyone away. Um, and, well, unless they don't want to do the programme, well, that's fair enough, but they've got a 90% success rate. 
I want to see the church with a 90% success rate. I'm going to try and answer this in a way that isn't too aware of the purple shirt sat over there. <laughs> Be merciful. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think at the moment, uh, and forgive me for this, but it seems that the Church of England in its outward-facing capacity is just sort of shooting itself in the foot over and over again um, and uh, speaking to the public in ways that just don't connect and make it seem a bit irrelevant. Um, However, you go onto the wings in prison and you spend time with prison chaplains, whether they're Church of England or Roman Catholic or Free Church, and that is what the church is, and it is doing an astonishing job in very difficult circumstances with basically no money. And parishes that slightly, I, I do a little bit of work for a charity called the Welcome Directory, which is a directory of faith communities, all sorts of faiths, that commit to offering a welcome to people who leave prison, and they commit to doing some training about that and, uh, you know, before it actually happens so that they're prepared. And you look at what the church is doing in those places, and you think this is absolutely remarkable, and nobody hears about it outside of those environments. And that's such a tragedy, because if they did, it would, just going and shadowing a prison chaplain for one day will explain to you more about the faith than 35 press releases and ill-informed articles in the paper, like the amazing article in The Telegraph yesterday that sort of said, it can take only five weeks to become a Christian. Well, <laughs> okay. This is not reflecting well on the person who wrote it, but all the church, unfortunately. Um, and I think that would be my, like, right to your prison chaplain. Go in on a Sunday morning, go to a service. It's absolute chaos. And if you're the sort of person who doesn't like people sitting in your seat at church, maybe don't go. Um, <laughs> Or do, because it will really change your view. But that is what the church is for me. And, um, uh, and part of you know, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing, the, the doctorate and the book, and, is to just stand there and say, look at these people. They are living out the gospel every single day. That's what we believe. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. I think it's been some really great insights, some really great challenges for us all here. Um, just as we wrap up, I think it'd be really nice to end on a, uh, a positive note. Of seeing, Maybe I'm positive. Well, <laughs> I've really tried. <laughs> <laughs> An even more positive note. Oh, okay. Just, um, if you could, briefly, um, just a, a moment. We started talking about those kind of moments of seeing justice in the face, as it were face to face with justice, to wrap up a, a moment where you've been really encouraged the power of justice. We've got an ongoing issue at the moment at the church I attend with somebody who has been in prison a number of times and who was baptised in prison by Jonathan. Um, and he's come to church, and it's been fantastic having him. And then a couple of weeks ago, he dropped off the radar, and we hear he's back in custody. And then he will come back. And we will stand there and say, welcome back. And somebody will go to court for the latest thing and stand there and support him. And if he goes to prison, we'll visit him. And if he doesn't go to prison, he'll be back on the Sunday. And we'll try again. And we'll keep trying. And this, is, this, is, this has been absolutely nothing to do with me. It's been the vicar and Jonathan 
and members of the congregation. And I'm so proud of being part of a church that can not only give somebody like that the second chance, but will do it again and again and again, exactly as we are commanded to do. Is that justice? Or is it, is it behaviour that sort of mitigating what sometimes passes for justice in this country. I'm not sure, but you, want, you wanted a positive ending. And um, for me, that's been the most positive thing in my field over the last few months. Uh, I've got quite a few examples of where um, I've been on murder investigations and, you know, serial killers and I've seen homicide investigation teams really working together to get that perpetrator and serial rapist the same thing and putting them before the courts and you see the victims getting some closure um, or the victim's family getting some closure so I've countless examples of them but um, a couple of them in the book but I, I think the one for me was um, sorry to be a bit eye centric but there was um, there was a group it's still in existence I believe it's a uh, a group that used to be in South London South West London called So Solid Crew and it's um, into this music called um, Garage Garage Music um, I'll, I'll explain it to you afterwards if you really need to know. But in the meantime, you can Google it. Um, so garage music is very urban, very street, and it's lifted a lot of youngsters out of that poverty trap. But some of them still get caught up in it. Some of them, in the process of just growing up in deprived communities, crime-infested communities, they are still things that draw them back. Um, and um, I was asked to, to work with members of the So Solid crew. There's, there's 21 of them in, in this group, so it was quite, quite difficult to relate to all of them. Uh, but the main person I related to was um, the leader of this group. He was named, it's called Mega Man. <clears throat> and um, he, I, I saw a leader from the streets galvanising this group of youngsters into the fact that their, their message is in their music and their mess is in their, their message. And they get number one with a track called 21 Seconds to Go. And it, 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 someone knows it, right? OK, OK. You're more hit than I thought. More woke. <laughs> Got a woke crowd here, man. <laughs> anyway, it ends up that Mega went back. It, it, this was... Um, it, they've been established for years, but he goes... He's at, still got some feuds with some people. I told him, Mega, don't get into this. Anyway, it ends up that he went back to his old estate to deal with someone. I don't think he was going to kill them, but unfortunately he went with someone who had a gun and... He said something to the person, and that person came at him, and the other person with Mega pulled out the gun and shot the guy dead. Now, the guy admits he's killed the man, he's dead, and he's done for murder. But they then decide to um, prosecute Mega Man. Well, he went on the run, had to find him, which didn't help about, you know, the, the fact that he's guilty, or people's perception he's guilty. But he went on the run, it, they, they, they got him, and he ends up in the old bailing. Uh, before the case, I, I get a call from his lawyers saying, could you do a character reference for Mega Man? <laughs> well, did I pray on that one? Oh, I but it still came out, yes, I will. And I wrote that character reference, and I had to give evidence three times because there's two mistrials. And the third trial, at the, this is all at the Old Bailey, he gets found not guilty. And the essence of my character reference was 
I'm not saying that he was guilty or not. All I'm saying is I saw a leader. I saw a leader and I didn't see any violence in him. I didn't see any sort of um, retribution and, and a feud on the street. I saw someone who's quick on his feet, saw an opportunity. The music was saying what their experiences were, what's their reality, and launched them into stardom. And not just in this country, but all of That's how I saw I saw an entrepreneur, I saw a leader, I saw a dynamic young man pulling his way out of poverty. It, so I said that to say our justice. I, the justice within the jury, the jury saw all of that. But if looks could kill, how those my colleagues who were persecuting, not persecuting, prosecuting, let's get it right, prosecuting um, prosecution witnesses, because obviously it's the, the barristers who are doing the prosecution, but the officers. Look, were looking at me as if, what are you doing? What are you doing? This man is as guilty as sin, type look, and you should be in the dock with him, type thing. Um, but I was prepared for that, because I remember uh, one of my American colleagues, he was in, in, helped set up the national BPA in the States in the 70s. We set up in the 90s. And he said, Leroy, at some stage, someone's going to come to you and ask for something like this. And for me, the justice was Mega Man has turned his life around. He has not committed any uh, other offences. He is a real advocate for change. And he's talking to young people in a way that it's, it's just amazing. And I remember going to a, an event, uh, we'll close with this. It was in Millbank, and they were having uh, one, one of these, his crew is called Harvey. And Harvey's, a bit of a, you know, he's, he's in chat shows now, you know. They, and uh, they said, Mr. Logan spoke up for us. You know, he allowed people to understand what we were trying to do and how we were going to do it. So um, I do apologise, a bit eye-centric. But it was just to show the justice of the jury understanding that it's, it, it's not one size, one, one side of the coin you have to see. Both sides. Thank you. It's been a real privilege to, to speak to you both this evening. Um, thank you so much um, for, for our online viewers. Um, I believe this will be the end. Um, but I do hope you can stick around uh, for those of us in the room. I'm sure many people would like to, to, uh, to meet you this evening if you can stay for a little bit longer. But why don't we end with uh, showing our appreciation. <laughs> <laughs>